hello everyone and thank you for coming back to my channel my channel is Deb Chanel's footage world really appreciate y'all stopping by the house coming over seeing what I have to talk about what's trending out there just to see what I got going on over here okay but I'm sure you all heard or maybe you didn't hear about Mark Curry yes the former NBA basketball star also the person who had his own show on TV, I forgot what programming station it was on, but y'all knew him um, by hanging with Mr. Cooper. This is Klein to Fame for his little show that was on. It was big in the uh, 80s, so I think it was the first part of the 90s. But anyway, huge, 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 just like uh, that man Steve Harvey. But honey, Mark Curry is tearing him up from limb to limb. I caught it on Fox Soul TV, okay, you know, uh, check it out, check it out, it was on Mike Hill's show, or the Mike Hill and Donnie Harrell show, over there on Fox Soul TV, you can catch him on Facebook, <coughs> excuse me, Instagram, and um, YouTube, and I actually got this particular clip from YouTube that I'm going to be sharing throughout my video, Okay, because it's part of my commentary. And we're going to just kind of see what in the world was going on. Okay, what has transpired to make Steve Harvey feel like he can go take and, and take on somebody else's material and use it as his own. Isn't that copyright infringement? Especially if you don't get the permission of the person and you're not doing like commentary on it or using it for schooling purposes or you know what I'm saying? The Fair Act Disclosure Act, okay? Or the Fair Act Usage Disclosure Act. So I'm like, what's Steve doing over there using other people's material? Especially if you have spectators Fans, viewers, or whatever of the comedy uh, scene, they go and watch Bruce Bruce, Cedric the Entertainer, Steve Harvey, Bernie Mac when he was alive, uh, Chris Raw, any other ones out there. And you know what material came from what material. Child, please. Woo. Uh uh uh. Come, come here. Hold on, y'all. We're just going to shut you out if you're going to continue to do that. Okay. But anyway, so basically I'm just hearing it and, and seeing it on different um, platforms and whatnot. And, you know, I'm always going to be peeping, looking at Mike Hill from his um, little platform to see what he got going on. Is he aspiring to excel on his own? His own merit and not using his uh, future wife's uh, resources or anything of that nature. Kind of like Todd Tucker, what he doing over there. But it seems like Mike is trying to work, do his thing, put spins on things. Because I'm still trying to see this dating show that's supposed to be coming up next year that him and his wife, future wife Cynthia Bailey, is supposed to be starring or co-starring in. Yeah, they're supposed to be having a dating show going on. Similar to one uh, that they met on. Steve Harvey show and they partake of his particular dating show. We'll see how it lasts. I don't, you know, I ain't gonna say it now. I'm just gonna watch and see. I don't have high hopes for it, but they may intuitively uh, make me out to be a liar. Maybe in a successful show, but we'll see. But anyway, um, Mark Curry had called Steve Harvey out on Mike and Donnie. Um, Harrell's little show they have over there on Fox So I don't think Donna Harrell was there at the time I think he was off doing something else And they had a another um, person sit in for him to host the show Even though Mike could have probably did it by himself Because he's kind of got that takeover spirit He's like, you ask him a question Or he asks a question He ended up almost trying to help you answer the question He had asked you to answer, okay? He, he just, he just look like he don't give you time enough to answer your questions before he interjects. And if he's sitting there on the receiving end where he's asked to ask answer a question or not because he's on somebody else's platform, he seemed to take over in the the guest spot. He wants to be the host. So, I 
don't know. Maybe it's just me, you know. Maybe somebody else can look into it and see if they're seeing the same thing. I'm not seeing that he does have a kind of takeover alpha male syndrome type of demeanor. Or is, is it just me, you know, hating on the brother? I don't know. But anyway, let's get on into some of this commentary and we'll, like, have our sidebars when we really feel we need to interject or try to understand some reasoning of why uh, Mark Kerr is feeling the way he's feeling that he felt Steve stole his material material, and used it for his own uh, upkeep or in his commentary to keep him alive and more fresh and relevant because uh, they're hoping that I guess nobody will really see them on the um, comedy strip scene so they can see where it originally originated from the commentary or the skits that Steve is using, you know, because I'm pretty sure they borrow each other's material sometimes, but then they'll pay homage to that person and say, you know, I got this from so and so and so, so, or I got this from my curry, shout out my curry, or, you know, I got this from Sid, and I want to see what it would do for me, you know, just give them homage, and I think once you do that, you might slide them some money under the table, especially if it was a successful show or whatnot, then they wouldn't have nothing to say, but when you don't get them nothing, then... That's another whole ball game and another whole era you're gonna go down. But let's get into this commentary and see what y'all think. Here we go. Actually, for Harvey, the job after me. I picked him. Uh, okay, so tell me about this head thing. Well, so what's up with you and Steve, man? Uh, ain't nothing, ain't nothing with me. I, well, Steve stole my material on his show, so I had a beef on that. On what show? Uh, when he was on his the, the, the bullshit talk show he had. And he did. He, he said all bullshit my talk show. One Halloween. I'm watching that. Somebody called me and said, man, homeboy doing your material. So he did my whole Halloween run. And I know he didn't think of it. You know, this, this is the true stuff that really happened to me. Uh -huh. And so my thing is, you didn't have to do that, homeboy. Right. So, you know, motherfucker, you made enough money, bitch ass. You, know? <laughs> you made enough money. You did enough. You know what? Why are you on my material? Right. You know, what's that about? You right. know, and then, you know, people want to jump up. Oh, he didn't know. He didn't steal your. So, yes, yeah. he did. Um, you know, so, you know, and so that, that, I hate this. Yeah, I hate those people that come in and try to take up for somebody that they know don't do something wrong and they try to deflate and say they ain't mean it that well. No, they didn't take. You know, it's like Dr. Heavenly always be up. Uh, Dr. Jack is behind, fully soaked up. They're just stuck up there like a hard piece of itch that can't come out you have to take a laxative or whatever that's pretty much how i see dr hevelin be uh fronting for dr jack when she be over there in marital medicine sitting out there giving her little two cents three cents four cents and it's all for the negative and the stuff that she really want to say she let her little henchman uh dr hevelin speak it out so it don't look good on, or look bad on her because she ain't use no cuts words she ain't use you know no foul language or nothing to that effect uh, to mess up her reputation. But honey, we already know you say them words behind closed doors. You probably be worse than what Dr. Hamlin is portraying on Front Street for you. But yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't like no people that do that. Be taking up for folk. Especially in Kenya uh, Ram too, Kenya Moore. How she does some unforgivable things. And I'm not, she's not the only one on the show, Nene too. <coughs> but just saying... <clears throat> just make a similarities or whatever. You can't be justifying people's bad behavior and be like taking up for them for the positive. Like, no, nah, they ain't mean it that way. They ain't mean to say it. Yeah, they did. Okay, they might have were angry at the time. They weren't focused, and they just let caution go to the wind and it just spoke their mind. But just address it how it is, you know. And then they can come back and say, you know what, I was upset. I meant it at the time that I was saying it, but when I thought about it, yeah, I could have chose my words differently. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I was, you know, in another frame of mind, and, you know, I was just angry at the time. Now, that would be more believable and forgivable than somebody just coming out there knowing they wrong, and they say foul stuff, and then they got their entourage or their yes people or people that want to take up for them and say, oh, they didn't mean it. Y'all don't really know her. Y'all don't know what they show y'all or whatever. And things of that nature. But let's go on back. Let's go back and listen some more. No need to do, No one else has did that. Mm -hmm. to, so to this was on his talk show. Which talk? Was his TV talk show? His TV talk show. Okay, this was uh, the one he had on NBC just recently. Whatever, yeah. That, okay. The one that, that, damn. Who took his show from it? And see, I don't like how Mike doing it. He's just a little shit starter. Because he's sitting up there. He know exactly 
what Mark Curry was coming on, who he was coming on to talk about, what platform that they were uh, specifying that, you know, Steve Harvey had stole his material. And he's trying to, like, bait Mark Curry into the situation where they're getting on my nerve. But anyway, um, yeah, bait Mike in. I mean, Mark and to say, yes, it was the Steve Harvey show. Yes, Steve Harvey stole my material. Yes, because see, he's friends, a so-called wink, wink, friends with Steve Harvey. So, he don't want to put Steve Harvey under the bus too much. So, he's not saying Steve Harvey. He's letting Mark say all the foul stuff and reference to what show they're talking about without it having to have to come out of his mouth. But he does come at the tail end. After everything has been shown and told to us by Mark Kerr, then he want to slide in. I'm like, nah, ain't Mark. Um, he just like a Wendy Williams. You know what I'm saying? But at least we know how Wendy started. She started being messy. She ain't like befriend folks and then just turn and switched up. Uh, made a 306 degree turn and, and, and became this foul person. No, Wendy started off foul. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that just grew her more likability because she was standing in her own shit, talking her own shit about celebrities. And half the time she was correct because she hung around them. Okay? Well, some of them anyway. But let's get on back to this um, commentary. Uh, Kelly Clarkson. How can Kelly Clarkson take your show, homie? Hey, bro. Damn. Mm. You know, so, 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 I actually, took my but, Kelly Clarkson. You know what's crazy? Damn. I met my fiance on Steve's show. On Steve oh, really? Harvey's talk show, yeah. so so that's that's another story. But I want to get back to that because I think that is the most lewd thing a comic can do. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like me, right. to me, right. I step to you, right? I'm gonna step to you. You ever step to him? Yeah, step to him. What you say to him? Well, yeah, yeah, tell I mean, us about you know, that. Tell, ask him. Okay, I will. That, but I, was we that got the you. first time <laughs> that had ever happened to you? Um, no. No, okay. For, what irritated you, you so much about Steve doing it? Because he made it. He's he's okay. he's there. He's he's on national no TV. You got you paid. You did your thing. You you try to either you fucking with me or you disrespecting me or you you know I I don't understand that. You taking food out of my money. I, I my I, you know you taking whatever. You know what I mean? I get what you're saying. Yeah, you I, got I don't. Food I don't out your and I fully understand and concur with Mark Har uh Mark Curry all the way because I'm like. I ain't never seen Mark Curry on Steve Harvey's show. Have y'all, fat chaps, get in there and tell me, my family, tell me if y'all seen Mark Curry ever appear on the Steve Harvey show. I know I've seen Cedric the Entertainer. I've seen um, D.L. Hughley. And uh, it was really the cast of uh, the Kings of Comedy. And then I think they had the Women's of Comedy, uh, Queens of Comedy as well. But not mentioning the late Bernie Mac or whatnot, because I think he had expired by that time. But, um, yeah, I've seen some other comedians come. But I don't think I ever had the opportunity to witness, for my own eyes, Mark Curry coming on to Steve Harper's show. So I'm like, damn, Steve Harper don't like certain people. And then, quiet as is kept, spoken out loudly on my platform, um, shoot. Steve don't like nobody. He don't even like his staff. You got to make an appointment to even have a conversation of just saying good morning to him. Ain't that some mess? He was voted one of the most, most worst or hated employer to work for. And I'm like, who want that claim to fame? You Somebody got to make an appointment just to say hello to you. How you doing? That trivial, okay? Not to mention if you want to ask for a day off or you want to talk about the show or how y'all want to design the show for that time, or who we want to bring on the show, who he feel he want to see. You know, you got to make appointments for all that. They even said, now this is just, you know, people just talking and whispering out there in the street. Don't know if it's true. You can't even uh, speak to him. If you see him, he don't, want to, he don't even want you to acknowledge him. He wants to walk by you. You could have been at his table breaking bread with him, throwing up, Cavassier, Hennessy, Ciroc, smoking those uh, blunts or what do you call it, cigars or whatever, how men get down or whatnot. And then the next day, you think of everything cool and kosher because you were just at the brother's house chilling, kicking it back with him. And then you can't look him in the eye. You can't say good morning to him or just rush to his office to just, you know, spill some tea, you know, or whatnot. What's going on in the network or whatever. You got to make an appointment to see him. He got to protect his environment. He got to protect his 
space. I'm like, and I please, okay, retire and go on and handle your business. Fully retire. Get out the scene and go enjoy yourself. If you don't make that much money, you you can't even waste your time counting it because it's just that much. Go on and do what you got to do, but you ain't got to be here with the regular folks getting up, uh, working at 9 to 5 or whatnot. You ain't got to do all that. Go on and set sail and plant your roots somewhere in the society of retirement, okay? If you want all that peace and serenity and people not getting on your nerves and not coming to you like you some kind of god out there. I'm like, really? Who is bowing down to you? I don't know, honey. I don't know. But anyway, let's go back to the article and get a little bit more edification here. Uh, that's plagiarism, right? Wow. So, I mean, so we got you here. Steve yeah. ain't here. I'll yeah. ask Steve later. What you say to him when you when you step back? Okay. What was it? And I see Mark, I mean, not Mark, Mike trying to play the role. Like, now, you, if you really wanted some beef, you would have wanted some ratings going off the roof. Hell, you should have called Steve Harvey, even if you had to get him on the phone. He have a phone conversation, a phone call in. You know, and one of them Skype type things. Put him on the big screen and let them go at it. You know what I'm saying? That would have been good television. And your ratings would have been, who? So high, please. They would have gave you a show instead of canceling your show. Oh, God. But anyway, yeah. <clears throat> they could have had Steve up there on the big screen rebutting or refuting anything he was saying or letting them know, hey, man, come talk to me. You ain't got to put us all on front street. You know, kind of what he did with Monique. And Monique ended up just showing him just showing everybody Steve's behind, okay? She served Steve asked up on a silver platter because she definitely got in him about this whole Netflix thing. And um, he talking about he'd rather sell his integrity, pretty much his soul, to make sure his family continued to eat. And, honey, that's still renaissance or, or rena renouncing or resounding in our minds, or at least in my thoughts when I think about it. I'm like, that brother said that he would sell his soul. He would pretty much sell his integrity, his character, his essence of who he is for a dollar. Girl, that's a hot mess, but let's go on back on. What things out was it? No, I, I saw him at the, um, at the, uh, the, um, not the, uh, the Def Jam 25. Oh, Def Jam, okay. So okay. when I see you, I see you. Okay. So when I see you, I step to you. No matter where we at. Right. It ain't waiting, so I step to you. Uh huh. Step to you. Did he apologize? No. Nah. He said he didn't know? Of course. Okay. How often does that happen in comedy? I think it happens often. Um, thief ass motherfucker? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of thief ass, thief ass dudes out there. Right. Yeah. But other people, other comments, you guys know about that, right? What? I mean, and then you, and you kind Hold of down. shun Because I've heard other names. I'm not going to mention any names about some of the comments that have these reputations for stealing other people's yeah, material. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people steal. Yeah. I see a, every time I see a special, I see a little bit of me. Mm -hmm. I see a little bit of my, some of my mannerisms or something. But I look at it as like, oh, well. You know. Well, now you're on tour now, and... You are doing the clubs. Do you stop people from coming in with their cell phones? Does it bother you? Uh, it now doesn't that bother in the you. Can't stop media it. World? You can't stop it. Yeah. So you gotta just be good. You can't. You can't stop people from videotaping. That lady over there was videotaping. So you know, right? right. You know, they gonna videotape. Just be. Lord, Mark Curry is calling somebody out in the audience. <laughs> Of the Donnie show. Okay, the Donnie. What did I shoot? Mike Hill and Donna Hill show. He is calling some lady that's out there with her phone. But like, people got to understand, yes, yeah, social media has taken over. People will sit there and see you bleeding on the street. They'll see you fighting somebody for dear life. And the first thing they'll be sent up there was putting out their phone, recording it. Ha seeing every play-by-play, -play, every blow-by-blow, -blow, every talk, every sound that's coming out they got a videotape and when everything is said and done they don't upload it or whatever and then they're gonna say do you need help <laughs> I'm like no no and i have been a witness of that i have definitely been a witness of people doing some crazy stuff like that instead of calling 911 and then get the footage if you must okay but mm -mm, it's always somebody pulling out a phone somebody capturing somebody's clips on something 
and just going, you know, they don't care if they really even get money for it, unless it's really salacious, like, you know, allegedly Todd Tucker caught himself coming out of a hotel downtown somewhere, and somebody caught him, uh, so I guess some kind of TMZ paparazzi of Atlanta, honey, he went and fleeing, he started getting up out of there, he was running track like it wasn't nobody's business, but he had got caught, he had hit social media trending things on social media on everybody's platform, People got the information, talked about it, and it blew over because Candy did the smart thing. She didn't come out and say anything about it. What, you know, why feed the fire, okay? It's going to die down sooner or later. But if you keep having those little acts, then it just is what it is. They'll see each other in court, I guess, because they did sign a prenup. So I'm pretty sure she already done told me. He already knows. It's only certain things you could do. And once you do it and I find out about it, it's a wrap, okay? But let's go on back to this commentary. Good, you know, when you do it, just be good. You know? Well, this is live, so it's going out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> People here, this is yeah. not gonna stop. We're here. But let's, let's talk because, you know, like I, I told you out there, your mannerisms, your inflections mm -hmm. remind me, like when you're doing some certain characters on stage, you remind me a lot of Richard. That's a, right. A That's lot right. of Richard, just like your, yes, you do. I mean, I mean stop it. <laughs> well, at least he paid homage to. Some of his mannerisms that he's saying Mark Curry got from um, reminds him of Richard Pryor, the late Richard Pryor. So I'm like, mm, could he be taking some of his material? Do we all take a little bit of everybody's material as long as you pay homage and you say, this is where I got my material from. Hey, give them props. Don't make like you did it on your own or you created it on your own when you know you borrowed it okay so why not go on and say hey i got it from here just like i told you i got it from fox soul tv baby yeah i'm just like the same influence yes. man i'm much of an influence obviously i, I love influence i opened up for richard pryor in 1993 mm -hmm. and you know he talked to me in my ear he told me things i'll never tell nobody but he told me things about comedy and me and him talk. So I got to talk to the master of the master of the masters. Mm -hmm. And he's the greatest to me. He's Absolutely. the greatest. No one even could come close. Mm -hmm. No one even got close. They can, it was Richard Pryor, and then there's no one. Mm -hmm. That's the way I feel. And I, it's so funny. I was listening, looking, I, I listened to Richard Pryor on Brian. But I got to, you know, do my side, boy. Yes, it's Richard Pryor. But then there's definitely, oh, guy, Red Fox. He had his show, oh, guy. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you had Robin Harris, so honey, but maybe that was just his fave, his fame to claim of who really got him started and wanted to do comedy. So I can get it. I can get it. I know. I have all of all of his albums, and in my you know in my room I have vinyl, so I just just put on a, a Richard Pryor, any of them. Right. And I listen to them over and over. Not that I'm trying to steal his material, but. He, he was groundbreaking. He talked yes. about things that no one else did. So I just try to look at his, his segues. And how did he, you know, I, the one bit, he did like five characters in one bit. He talked, the characters talk, I'm like, this is incredible. And one movie I did, like um, Richard Pryor did play in, I think it was called The Toy. He was some kind of little, well, he really wasn't, but the this man uh, the father, some young guy, a young little boy, he was like a toy manufacturer or something like that, and he just had billions of dollars or whatever, and he had no time to entertain or be like a father should be, because he was just really trying to make money, leave his son or his children um, all this money, but I think it was called The Toy, and Richard Pryor um, came out and was kind of like his little playmate. Uh, kind of look a little Michael Jackson type thing where he only catered to kids. But he did have a life, you know. It ain't like Michael Jackson just was stuck in his childhood and whatnot and just wanted to be totally around kids because they was just so innocent and they didn't want anything from him, which with um, just a comparison with adults, it's always somebody having a hidden agenda. They want something monetary from you and they just don't know how to come to you right out and just tell you that. But they'll just play like they like you or maybe they genuinely do like you, but they know that they want, they have additional stuff they want to try to get out of you. But with kids, they just going to tell you honestly what they want. And they're going to really cost too much of anything. And half the time, it's just wanting to play and, and, and have the resources of so many games and so many endless moments of, in time that, you know, is wasted in playing. So looking through a child's heart and a mind is just so sacred and so 
uh, light, um, lightless or, or it's just, you know, innocent and it's pure. And you can only get that when you're a child because, you know, you see, a, you know, you act like a child. You see things so simple through a child's eyes. And we as adults, as we continue to grow and get older, we make things so complicated. And we have so many different layers that we have to peel off to get to something a kid could have said. You should have did it this way and been done with it and moved on. And then in hindsight, you were like, well, damn, I sure could have. What was I overanalyzing for? But anyway, I just said that to say that it was the the movie that I did like that was very comedian, uh, co comedic. Wait a minute, comment. It was a very uh, comical type show, but it was actually a movie. I think it was called The Toy. But anyway. Not mud ball. It's a, I think it, he's talking to. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I can't remember what the bit was. But it was five characters, and, I, and I, to this day, I'm trying to do that. Right. I'm trying to do, you know, and Richard Pryor talked about himself. Mm -hmm. and that's something I don't know how to do because I was famous early and I never want to talk about myself because I lived, in, you know, my boys in the ghetto. I didn't ever, I never, I didn't ever want to, I was shy about, I didn't want to know about, Mr. Cooper was international. Yeah. I went international, mother. International. <laughs> I'm yes. from Africa to Australia to Germany. No matter where I go, they know me. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I never talked about myself because it felt arrogant to me. Mm -hmm. So that's why Richard Richard opens up about himself. You don't know nothing about me. You guys don't know anything about me because I never talk about me. Okay. And that's what I, I would love to do. You know, I'm learning how to do it. Why do you, you know? think you can't do it? Again, because I, I never talked about myself because being from Oakland, being from the hood, you know, you're quiet. I don't trust these fools out here in L.A. I don't trust <laughs> nobody. So I just, just I, I, you know, I just walk. I, I look at everything, you know. Now, it would be, it, now, I find that very hard to believe that he said he don't, well, okay, I can understand he's saying he don't trust nobody, this, that, and the third. But I was just like, he was saying, I, I don't be trusting nobody in L.A. Uh, I don't be trusting these folks out here. I just look at them and observe them or whatnot. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to keep them quiet while I tape. I don't know why they feel like they have to be around me all the time. But anyway, let's get back on to this article. Oh, this commentary. Don't say nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just that old, old 80s dope dealer style. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, you know, move in silence. Right. You got and, the hat on, yeah. you're ready. You're scoping yeah, it out. Move in silence. Move in silence. It's easier, you know, like, to this day, like when I go to an event, I don't tell people I leave, I just leave. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Hey, I, I just leave. Jones, we got to dig more into Richard Pryor because this is like the yeah, fact Richard, that, yeah. that this man took you under his wing. As the goat, and he didn't take me under my wing. No, okay. Richard you can't say that. You I mean, but you were on tour with him. No, I just, I just opened up for you him. Opened, one but, time. But, but the fact that you opened up for him, whatever, what just like, and, then, <laughs> and then hearing this advice, whatever. What, what advice did he tell you? That See, Mike trying to take over. See the takeover spirit I was talking about. He trying to add words into. Him. Uh, Mike Curry's mouth when he ain't said it, he just said, Look, don't, don't put me on that pedal. So, no, sir, no, I only opened up. He only said this, that, that. And Mike said, Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but don't embellish, Mike. Let Mark say what he had to say and let it be. Don't try to over dramatize it. Don't try to embellish for Mark. That's when you get in trouble. And that's that takeover spirit that I told you Mike always have instead of him just listening. Stop listening to respond. Just listen to what your audience or your guest is saying and digest it, okay? And, and then talk of, talk about it, you know, outside of the camera on another time. But this is his time to shine. This is his time to put his spin on perspectives that or narratives that people have had out about him. And he's trying to break them all down. Let us have some edification so we can be in his corner to believe him uh, versus what we hear out on those streets that could be coming from anywhere, you know, any source and not not be true at all. So he's trying to tell you, Mike, stop over, you know, examining the situation and putting it in a format of sports statistics and things you're supposed to go by. This man is trying to tell you about some things. Listen. Damn. Still I, I won't tell what he ever told me. Oh, you, you, you won't, won't ever tell yeah. what he told me in my ear. Uh -huh. But we talked. I talked to Richard Pryor. I talked to the greatest. Right. After that, you got a chance to talk mm -hmm. to Richard. Right. You know, and we talked. It was it was amazing. You, you opened up for Richard. Opened up for Whitney Houston. Yeah, I was on tour with and Ray Charles. Ray Charles was the first person. I mean, damn, but that was like a rehab. Three on three, you know, like... Ray, yeah, Ray Charles. <laughs> like, you know, when I opened up for Ray Charles, I, you know, I told my mom and daddy, I said, my... 
Okay, where did the rehab come from? I, I don't know what they, what are you trying to say? Whitney Houston, drug problems. Ray Charles, he drunk too much. I don't know, see, he just like, really? Hmm, I didn't get that one. I'm still in at my mama house. When you open up for Ray Charles. Yeah, I still in at my mama house. I said, Mama, about to go over Ray Charles. My father, oh, really? Yeah, I don't think my father believed me. Yeah, yeah, all right, good. Yeah, I, I went to go over for Ray, Ray Charles. I walked in, he was, he was in a room, in a dark room, sitting in the, sitting in the room. Boy, he don't need light. Yeah, that. Uh, he was a small man. Tell us about opening up for Whitney Houston. What was that like? How did that, that was come phenomenal. To Being on tour with Whitney Houston was incredible because here we are in front of 25,000 people, 30,000 people. I'm on stage. And Whitney Houston, I'm on stage. And Whitney Houston said, go, Mark, go, Mark. Wow. And I'm like, go, Mark, that's <laughs> Whitney Houston, she, she came and watched my set. Wow. She watched my set. That's yeah. a genuine heart. Yeah, that baby. I mean. I, I looked at the him best, watching myself. The voice, wow. like, Whitney Houston. That was crazy. Well, never like, will be a, ever again. Often imitated, but never duplicated. Right. Right. We're fans of yours while right. I was looking at you. But to know that other famous people are also fans of yours. You know, I don't even think I realized it. Mm. I didn't even tell, tell just a minute ago. <laughs> I didn't realize it. You know, I said, Dad, that was incredible. Mm -hmm. and I, never, I don't think I never told nobody that. That's the first time I ever told nobody. We never told about that. Wow. I didn't know that you, I knew that you had yeah. opened up for Richard Pryor, but I did not know that you opened up for Whitney Houston and Ray Charles. That's a incredible yeah, more experience. more people. That, I think I've opened up for everybody. You yeah. name them, I opened up for them. Okay. Every, everybody. What, what's, who's the most memorable one? Uh, Bill, uh, I did, uh, James Brown let me sing. He let yeah. you sing? Mm -hmm. let James Brown. Really? I was on, uh, we were in, uh, I can't remember where, uh, where was that at? I can't remember, but I was on stage. Okay, guys, well, I think that's going to go into a lot of more stuff that's going to go away from the Steve Harvey commentary that I was trying to bring you all. Um, if it comes into, when I finish listening to it, it comes into more, I'll do a part two to this video. But we would already done went into 30 minutes. And I know I don't want to keep y'all. I know I'm going to tear it too long, honey. So like, comment, subscribe to my channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And I will see you next video. Thank you. Bye. And get down in them comments and tell me what y'all thought. Do y'all think um, Steve Harvey was foul? Did he actually indeed steal Mark Curry's commentary and use it for his own come-ups? Okay, even though he's already was up there. All right, I don't know. Is it file on play? Is Steve over there smelling like a rotten egg? Did he steal that material like Mark Curry said he did? Y'all get in the comments and let me know y'all side. Y'all perspective, perspective on the subject matter. Mm, I know that's right. Get on his behind, Mark Curry. Call that spade out. All right, guys, see y'all next video. Bye.